Okay, thank you. Um, so, first to give you sort of an introduction, um, let me remind you of the context, as it, that you all know, is uh, on September 14, 2015, the two LIGO detectors in the US measured um, the deformation of space-time. They measured a, a strain, which is a, a fractional change in length, um, which was really small, but they are so sensitive that they can measure it. Um, so, and what they observed was, uh, in both detectors at the same time, roughly, um, they saw something signal like this. And um, the time here was about uh, five milliseconds. Okay. Uh, so here, let's say 0 0.5. Okay, um, of course it looked a bit more noisy, but um, this is what came out of the detectors after doing some filtering and whitening of the data. So it's basically, um, like you know maybe when you try to tune for a radio station, you turn the knob until you finally get a clear signal. This is what was done sort of to get this kind of um, signal that was seen. So now the question was, okay, what, what does that kind of signal mean? And that's where um, it was very important to have precise theoretical predictions that tell us what this kind of gravitational wave signal means. And this event was also called GW150914. That was the first um, detection of gravitational waves by um, ground-based detectors. Okay, so, so then um, the importance is of, uh, to interpret these signals. Interpretation need precise theoretical prediction. Okay, and that, that told us basically um, by comparing with these kinds of predictions that this signal actually came from two black holes um, of about 30 solar masses. And the signal can be divided into about three different stages. So first here, this part, um, let's put a, a dividing line here. Um, this part here is the end spiral where you had two objects orbiting each other. They had about 29 um, and 36 solar masses, and they were orbiting actually at about um, more than 75 orbits per second before merging. And these objects are objects with about 90 kilometer radius. So it's really crazy, these massive objects orbiting at these high velocities. So this is what, was, what generated this signal. Then here um, was the merger where the two objects collided and um, formed sort of a common object. And finally, um, the last part was the ring down where there was just a perturbed final black hole that um, sort of shed away its perturbations. Okay, and um, you can see all of this in Abbott et al. PRL. in 2016. Um, okay, so um, what is also important is that most of the details about the signal, for example, the masses and spins of these objects, um, comes from the um, in spiral where the, um, the um, measurements are very sensitive to the phase evolution of the system because the way um, information is extracted from these kinds of signals is, okay, you, you have this kind of signal in the data, and then you, you just have some theoretical models that uh, for different parameters that you compare with. So you might have a model that looks like this, and you see it doesn't match, but then you vary the parameters in the model until it, it produces the highest overlap with the signal. Okay, so, so the point is, okay, waveform depends on parameters.
So what that means is um, the masses of the objects. For example, if you have low masses, it means the amplitude will be lower and the um, merger will occur at higher frequencies. So that's how you can distinguish uh, the effect of the masses dominantly. Um, the spins will have an effect. So for example, when the spins are aligned, there's sort of kind of like a repulsive interaction that will cause the merger to happen earlier and will also cause a phase shift during the in-spiral. Then um, there could be, um, in, so in this case it looked like the orbits were almost circular, but they, they could also be on eccentric orbits, for example, that would manifest in the waveform. And um, for example, if the spins are not aligned with the orbital angular momentum, there will be precessional effects. So the waveform would have some modulations that look different. So um, all of these parameters, and then plus some parameters that depend on how the source is located with respect to us on Earth in the sky, which are called extrinsic parameters, is all of this is encoded in the waveform. And the theoretical predictions allow us to know how this dependence, um, uh, how, how, what exactly this dependence is, and then we can compare with the data to find out what the signal was. And also for weak signals, sometimes, for example, for the second detection, um, the signal was so weak that you also needed models to even say that there is a signal there because it was so small in the noise, but by cross-correlating it with the models, you could extract the signal. Okay, so all of this um, is uh, um, the general setup for why we need a precise theoretical understanding of, of these binary systems. And um, so for black hole binaries, as you will hear probably in, in the next lecture, in some lecture on black holes this week, um, for black holes, you just have masses and spins plus the orbital eccentricity maybe for black holes. So I, I use BH to denote black holes. Um, only masses and spins. Okay, up, up to, um, let's say, maybe plus eccentricity, but uh, yeah, and then the extrinsic parameters. Okay, but for other objects besides black holes, there could be, um, let's, let's say, more interesting effects. So, I, of course, black holes are really interesting in themselves that you can have these objects that consist only of warped space-time and are characterized entirely by these parameters. But um, more interesting effects or, or different effects could arise for other objects. Okay, other, other objects. And um, to, to uh, just give you an overview of what kinds of effects there could be, let me just try to draw again this waveform for black holes. Um, okay, uh, not, not really. Okay, let's say they merge here and then the ring now. Okay, and um, so, so let's say we uh, don't consider here the early part because there will be about uh, 10 to the three or so cycles where any kind of object will look identical because when the objects are really far apart, it doesn't matter what kind of object they are, they will simply act like point masses and so the signals will be identical. So identical for all objects. So I mean, okay, this 10 to the three, um, let's say, so this is for, um, for low mass systems. So for high mass systems, this will be uh, much fewer, but you know, that there will be some portion of the signal where um, objects look identical. So, so this is for, for neutron stars, let's say. Okay, and, and then the, the waveform from these other objects 
So let me just label it. This is the black hole, black hole waveform that is going to be the baseline. Um, for other objects, I'm going to draw in dashed um, other objects. Just could be anything, just to illustrate what kinds of effects could be there. So there will be a small dephasing. Will look fairly similar, but get out of phase. Okay, still dephasing, even more, 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 more. And then, okay, there's a merger regime we don't know. And then a post-merger also we don't know. And so the effect that, that so, so this dephasing, the amount of that dephasing encodes a lot of information about the nature of these objects. And that information comes in in different ways. So first, um, there will be the rotational deformation of the object. So rotational deformations. Because then the multipole moments um, due to the rotational deformation are going to be different from black holes. Okay, and it's because the objects now deform, um, they rotate and deform. So they, they are, multiple moments are different than black holes. Okay, th th so that's the first thing that comes in. It's uh, depending on the uh, spin of these objects, it can be uh, small or large. Then the next thing that comes in is, so you know black holes have a horizon, so it absorbs, uh, any black, a black hole absorbs everything that falls into it. But for other objects that don't have a horizon, they don't absorb all the um, radiation that comes, comes in. So that's the next thing that comes in, is um, effect of, uh, effect of non-horizon. Okay, and that, that's more in the dissipative part of the, uh, of the effect. Okay, finally, we have at, at very high frequencies, we have tidal effect. Is because um, for extended objects, um, the, there's a variation in the gravitational field, let's say, across mass distribution, and so um, they will tidally deform in response to the companion's field. Okay, and then here the merger could be very different. So, could be merger um, instead for for some, for example, some scalar fields. You can not ha form a black hole, but instead have some repulsive repulsive state at the end. Or it can happen that the tidal effects become so strong that the objects are actually tidally ripped apart, so they get tidally disrupted. Um, so th th these are, of course, all the, all the most dramatic changes, much more dramatic than these small dephasings in the end spiral. But uh, merger, disruption, pff, question mark. We don't, we don't know for any kind of object. And then um, here, finally, we can have also some modification. We also still, it's many question marks. So there could be, um, for neutron stars, it could be a post-merger um, remnant. There could be echoes, uh, which are when some radiation gets, um, if, for example, if it's a wormhole, could get reflected back and uh, give an additional contribution. Could be just a modified ring down. Okay, so I, this is not an exhaustive list, but those are sort of the main things that people have discussed of how information about the nature of objects enters into the waveform. Okay, and so in this course, we're going to focus on tidal effects out of all of these. Because, so for neutron stars, um, these will be the largest or imprint of the structure on the gravitational waves as, as far as we know. Um, 
So, so there are some speculations about nonlinear effects and so on, but those haven't been worked out carefully. So for now, we think tidal effects are the most promising way to extract information about equation of state from um, neutron star observations. And um, yeah, so the, the goal will be to, to um, develop a precise description of these tidal effects and how they influence the gravitational waves. And to do that, we will first start by going back to Newtonian gravity and trying to understand tidal effects in Newtonian gravity uh, and formulating things in, an, in a very elegant language um, that is not, not unique to the description of tidal effects, but also is used in post-Newtonian theory in general. So it's, it's widely applicable. And um, in the end, we will arrive at an act. Uh, so we will um, first ask what details about the nature of these objects actually influences the gravitational waves. And then we will try to formulate an action principle to describe this, not, not uh, to describe the conservative part. And then we will see that this action principle can be made relativistic. So, so once we've done all the work in Newtonian theory, we will immediately be able to transcribe it to a relativistic result up to um, you know, asking how quantities are defined in GR. So, so all this work in Newtonian theory will be very valuable. In the end, it will save us a lot of work. And um, yeah, then we will discuss the effect on the gravitational waves. So the, the first part will be a bit maybe technical and dry, but it's basically to develop an elegant formalism to describe tidal effects. And that can really simplify the calculations. And as I said, it will be useful then to um, find a simple way to make it a relativistic action principle. OK, and um, any questions so far? Mm -hmm. So the question was, um, is it only the last few orbits to find the difference between other objects and black holes? And the answer is yes. Because when the objects are far apart, um, they, it, it doesn't matter what kind of object it is. It, it, they're like point masses. So, so they will, there aren't any effects that we know of that would uh, come in that when they're widely separated. Other questions? OK. So then I will start a bit. So we, we go back all the way to Newtonian physics and um, the gravitational potential. OK, so ju just to remind you, in, in Newtonian theory, because maybe now that you've thought about GR so much, you forgot about Newtonian theory. So um, in Newtonian, we have um, we have Newton's second law, m a for 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 an object, let's say, m a equals f. Okay, and here I use these um, squiggly things underneath a quantity to to denote a three vector, because so so a means now. It has three components, say AX, AY, AZ. OK. And then because um, in GR or later on, we might use um, the usual notation, for example, if you have something with an arrow above, this will be a four vector, and it will have components UT, UR, let's say, <laughs> or UX, UY, UZ. OK, this is just to explain some notation. Um, so whenever you see this squiggly, it's sometimes indicated in writing as bold phase. It means it's a three vector. OK, and um, so in, from Newton, we also know the um, inverse square law for the gravitational force. So we have F gravitational um, for an object is minus it, Newton's constant m m over r squared n. OK, so this is basically um, here small m is, let's say we have, OK, I should have. So here we have a small mass m. 
here we have a big mass M, and we are asking what is the force on the small mass? What, what is its acceleration? And here we have um, th this um, gravitational, so N is a unit vector, I should say. Um, N is a unit vector. So it's um, basically the distance between these objects, let's say, um, Okay, I didn't yet, yet choose an origin. Okay, let's just keep it as a unit vector. We will um, discuss later on uh, how to set up a coordinate system for this. Um, okay, and then we can write this, of course, as the gradient of a potential is minus, uh, uh, no, it's, uh, okay, it's m times the gradient of a potential where the gravitational potential is simply uh, the potential of the companion gm over r. Okay, now I do need to indicate the distance, so r is the distance between them. Okay, this is just to remind you of uh, some basic physics. So this is the gravitational potential generated by a point mass, so, so here, um, we're assuming it's a point mass. Okay, and then we can write Newton's law as simply A is equal to the gradient of a potential. Okay, but um, so now to make it more analogous with GR also, we want to, instead of having this kind of potential, we want to derive some sort of field equation uh, that this potential is a solution to. And we don't want to consider just point masses, we also want to consider extended objects because in the end our main goal will be to apply these tidal effects to neutron stars. They, they can be applied for any object, but the most interesting case will be for neutron stars, I guess. Okay, so um, so now um, we make it more specific. So we we now consider a body with mass m a, and its position is um, z a. Okay, and um, then we just ask what is the potential generated by this body itself. So we, we know from this, um, from a point mass, this kind of potential is here, but say we want to measure um, the potential at a point x, um, then we can say the potential at x is equal to, that is generated by body A, is equal to gma, or yeah. Okay, MA, let me change to capital M here. MA um, divided by now, I have here, because this is not at the origin, so I have the magnitude of X minus ZA. Okay, this is again for a point mass. But um, it can be generalized to extended bodies fairly simply by simply replacing this mass by an integral over the density of the object. So say the object actually has a density, so it's an extended object and has some density, rho A, density. Then um, we can ex say for an extended object, this potential is simply given by replacing the mass by an integral over the density distribution. So we have integral d cubed x prime. We integrate over the volume. Um, rho of x prime divided by x minus x prime. This is now for an extended, or let's say, yeah, extended object. And the integrals over, over 
a volume that um, includes the mass distribution of this object. Okay, so the next thing is to, um, instead of having this integral form of the potential, to derive a differential equation that it satisfies. And you've probably seen something like this also in electromagnetism, where, um, yeah, th this kind of problem comes up a lot. So, uh, in, instead of having this integral expression for the potential, we just want to write it with a diff in a differential form. And then there's a useful identity that you can check. A useful identity. When you operate with um, the Laplacian on this quantity 1 over magnitude of x minus x prime, this is um, simply minus 4 pi delta of x uh, minus x prime. Have you seen this before? OK. OK, so we can um, now operate. Let's see what comes out if we operate with this del squared on this kind of potential. Um, so we get then del squared ua is equal to and we um, pull this operator into the, into the integral here. Um, d cubed x, uh, oops, yeah, x prime, raw of x prime. Um, and then we have del squared of this quantity, x minus x prime. OK. and. Uh, so we get from here we get a delta function, which means the integral evaluates just to rho evaluated at x. So it's uh, simply minus four pi g rho of x. Okay, and this is sort of the main field equation, so to say, of um, Newtonian gravity for the gravitational potential. Okay, um, so the next thing, so this tells us now if we have a body, we can compute the potential outside of it at some field point, um, and we know we can also compute it by solving this differential equation. So, so now um, we consider an object that is almost spherical, and um, we want to consider it's sort of um, an expansion of the potential around a reference point. Because maybe we want to consider, um, okay, let me see. The, so the first thing we will consider is the expansion of um, the potential of the body itself. So say we have a body um, here, here it's, it's center of mass, the A, and we want to consider the potential, say, far, far away at point X. So the potential is almost, this plus some corrections because there is some variation um, due to the uh, distribution. So, so this is not spherical. For a spherical, it's just like a point mass, but um, just uh, so it's the, the potential is going to be almost like a sphere, but there will be some corrections. So we, we will need to know a general expression for the for the um, Taylor expansion for any field around a reference point. So this is now um, just, just um, a tool that we will then apply to the potential. So we have a Taylor expansion of some field, of some field, field uh, phi of x around a reference point. OK, Z, Z is just a reference point. We just want to say, in general, how do you Taylor expand a function around a reference point? OK, maybe it seems trivial, but it's good to remind you of, uh, of how it goes. So we have phi of x. Um, then we, we just Taylor expand, so it's phi of Z. Plus, and, and then now we take x minus z 
Okay. Mm, okay, so I will, I will now, um, instead of using these vector notations, I will now um, use the indices. So I will, I will write this x minus di, uh, di. So what that means is you're supposed to take this difference and dot it into the gradient operator. Okay, and repeated indices are supposed to be summed over in this case. Okay, um, so you differentiate the potential, um, evaluate at z, plus you do the same thing um, to higher order, x minus z i, x minus z j, di, dj. Oh yeah, I, also this di is supposed to mean d by dxi. And xi could be, if you're using Cartesian coordinates, could be xi, could be x, y, and z. Okay, that's just um, sort of a shorthand hand notation. Um, the idj of phi of x, and then once, once you've computed the derivatives, evaluate the result at z, um, and so on. Okay, and if you compute enough of these derivatives, you can actually find a pattern and you can find a very compact general formula, um, which um, is given by the sum over, let's say, L equals zero to infinity, um, one over L factorial. Um, okay, uh, X minus Z. Okay, I, I need to erase this notation part. So just remember di means d by dxi. Um, so x minus z l. So I will explain in a moment what this means. dl of phi of x evaluated at x equals z. Okay, that's, that's a general um, Taylor expansion, and what this means, so x minus z l is just a string of these, um, uh, um, these quantities, so it's x minus z uh, i, x minus z j, blah, 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 all the way up to x minus z l. That's just a usual short, shorthand notation, yes? Okay. Um, can, is it, uh, can you read this part already? Is it too small? I can uh, write it bigger, so. And can you see down here? If I write there or should I? Okay. So what does that, that mean, x minus z to the L? Okay, what does this L means simply um, a string of indices such that um, you should take x minus z i, so however many uh, products of this you have. So you could have x minus z k all the way up. You can have many, many more products of this x minus z L. This is just a, sort of a shorthand notation for this. And similarly, this DL, maybe I'll write it over here. So DL is supposed to mean D by DX1 or, or I, maybe I should use I to be consistent. D by DX2, J, all the way up d by dxl. You see, it's, it's just a very convenient notation because if you always have to write out all these products and derivatives, you go crazy after a while. But here you have a very compact formula. Maybe let me write it down um, again, very big, uh, phi of x. Taylor expanded is sum l equals zero to infinity. So L is just some arbitrary index, one over L factorial, um, X minus Z to the L, 
then L derivatives of this quantity evaluated at x equals z. And this is for an expansion around the reference point z. And this is going to be a very useful formula. This is for any, any quantity phi. We have not specified what phi is. We just say we can write um, the expansion around a reference point z simply as this. Okay, so now we apply this kind of expansion to the potential. So, um, okay, so we had um, this expression here for the potential. So now we, what we want to do is um, to expand um, around a point where, uh, or in a region where x is much larger than x prime. So x prime, remember, is the variable that characterizes some integration over the matter distribution, and x is the field point that is far, far away. Okay? So in, in that regime, we can um, tailor expand the potential as... Um, so, so we apply this general formula to ua. So we have integral d cubed x prime, rho of x prime, and then, um, okay, now we have to expand what, what this quantity, 1 over x minus x prime is, um, using this general formula. So we have x prime minus z a to the L, um, dL of 1 over x minus x prime, evaluated at x prime equals Z A. Okay, it's simply substituting. You see, you recognize. Oops, I forgot. Okay, I forgot half the things. No wonder it's confusing. Okay, um, U A is equal to sum L equals zero to infinity minus one to the L uh, over L factorial. Okay, um, ah yeah, because you're um, differ differentiating one over this, so you pick up um, occasionally some minus signs. So we have a minus one to the L, um, and then the rest I have. Okay, here's a row A. Okay, th this is simply now the potential of this of an object at um, a field point much larger than the object itself, and the object is assumed to be almost spherical. So um, we now want to, this is already a not so bad looking result, but we want to look, write it in an even more suggestive form. And um, to do that, we need to sort of rewrite um, this thing a bit in a, in a nicer way. What, what those derivatives are. So to um, further consider some simp simplification, so again, um, so this is the physical result. Now we introduce some more mathematical notation. So um, we consider a quantity um, R, because I don't want to always write this magnitude x minus x prime, so just, we just c consider first what it looks like for R, um, that is the square root of delta ij xi xj. Okay, and now we take some... Yes, yes this comes from... Um, I th I'm yet now not sure again if I for forgot it in the general expansion. Um, yeah, okay. I, uh, yeah, I don't know if, where it came from now at this point. Um, I think it... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I have to look it up and tell you later. So I'm not sure if I have a typo in my notes or... Um, 
maybe uh... okay I will tell you this afternoon um, okay anyway uh, so we have this quantity R Um, okay, you're saying because I'm differentiating one over instead of, yeah, yeah, that's that's very likely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So, so we we now instead of uh, to rewrite this quantity, as I said. Um, uh, we consider instead of, of this x minus x prime magnitude, we consider a simpler quantity to, to just um, develop the notation. So if we take a derivative, di of 1 over r, um, so, okay, we have to, it means d by dx i of this quantity, 1 over. So um, first, uh, we can write it as, Okay, um, so first we uh, differentiate one over r, so minus one over r squared, and then um, we differentiate this square root. So it's one half, um, and then okay, delta i j, and then so if if I differentiate, so if I differentiate the i x k, I get delta i k. Right, so actually, yeah, actually you will do these exercises uh, in the tutorial this afternoon, so maybe I won't uh, give you, uh, work it out here, but, but that's the basic idea. You, you differentiate this kind of uh, thing, and instead, again, you can play a similar trick and um, take enough derivatives of one over r to, um, Um, to find that, okay, um, let me see. Okay, yeah. To find the general formula, if you take L derivatives of 1 over R, you find that it's given by minus 1 to the L. So, so this is, you, you will work out um, multiple derivatives of this in, on the, in the afternoon today. So it's minus 1 to the L. And then 2L minus 1 double factorial. And then, okay, let me just write it down, n with some uh, new notation, um, divided by r to the L plus 1. OK, this is the general result. And what does that mean? OK, so n here, um, so ni is equal to xi over r. OK, so, and, R is simply the magnitude of x, basically. So this is a unit vector. And the notation of these uh, uh, square, uh, no, not, not square, uh, angular brackets means simply, so if I have, um, let's, say, let's say I have just two indices, n, i, j, okay? So instead of having L, I just consider L equals two, I get I have to compute what nij is. So what it means is um, you are supposed to, to take ni, so two products of this, and j. And now um, you're supposed to symmetrize on all the indices that are inside these angular brackets, which, OK, this is already symmetric. If I exchange i and j, the quantity is unchanged. And you're supposed to subtract the trace of it. So that when you contract it with delta ij, this quantity is zero. It has no trace. So you can show, and again, you will work on some examples this afternoon to, um, to show that this is trace-free. So I have to subtract um, this uh, minus one-third um, delta ij. OK, and these are called symmetric so the, this no notation with the um, angular brackets is called symmetric trace-free tensors.
and sometimes um, abbreviated as STF. Okay, and you will also see this afternoon how to construct it in general. Um, there's a general formula where you can um, know how to construct each, each of these. Um, for example, if you had four indices here, you will work out how to construct it in general. And um, yeah, so, so this is a very useful shorthand notation and it also has many uh, useful properties. Any questions so far now? Okay. And I should also say, so, so, so this notation and these symmetric trace-free tensors, they play a really important role in many calculations related to gravitational waves and post-Newtonian theory. So they're a really good tool to know how to use. But we will now apply them for tidal effects. Okay, so now um, an important property also of these tensors is that when you have another tensor, um, any tensor, and you contract it with such a symmetric trace-free tensor, only the symmetric trace-free part of that tensor will contribute. Um, so, yeah, I think we need this property, so let me just write it down. So for any tensor, um, So because, so you, so let me just say, so our goal is to rewrite this in a more suggestive form. Um, and you see, now we have sort of worked out what this dl of one over this r is, which is given by this general formula. Um, but now you see we have this other tensor, x prime minus z, contracted with these derivatives. So we have some general tensor contracted with this um, symmetric trace free part, so it's useful to know what piece of the, the x minus z l will actually contribute. So for any tensor um, T l, if we take uh, T l n symmetric trace free, um, this is the same thing as just taking the symmetric trace free part of that tensor. Okay, and so let's just check this quickly, um, this property. Let's say TL is simply equal to NINJ, which is not, is symmetric but not trace free, okay? So, um, so we take NINJ, contract it with this um, expression, so NINJ minus uh, one third delta i j. Okay, um, so when we contract n and n, it's, it's going to give one, so, so because n is a unit vector, so n is a unit vector, so n i, n i is equal to one, or n. Okay, so we get basically one minus one third here as the example. But if we contract um, two copies of the symmetric trace-free thing, we're supposed to now get the same thing. This can also be checked because if you contract two delta functions with each other, um, the result is three because you, you have to um, take the trace. So if we, ch we check what is nij, nij, okay, we find again it's, um, so now we have to take nij minus one third delta ij, nij minus one third delta ij. So again, we get uh, one from this here. Then we get, um, so let me write it down, it's equal to one. 
Then um, from n contracted with delta, we get minus one third, I think. Um, yeah, and we have again the same thing here, minus one third. And then we have the delta um, contracted with the other delta, and then one ninth in front of it. Um, so we get plus three ninths because um, delta ij delta ij is three because the delta ij is this matrix one 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 and zeros everywhere else. Okay, and okay, we we um, do the. We find the result two thirds. Okay, and here we didn't work it out finally. It's also two thirds. So we now know that this kind of identity is, at least for the case we have, is um, fine. Okay, so now we use uh, what we had here, and we go back to the potential, and we write it in this more suggestive form. Okay, so we had the potential UA, um, which was the sum over L, because we didn't yet truncate the Taylor series, minus one to the L, divided by L factorial. And then um, let me pull out this derivative, because you see here, um, this, this quantity is basically, because you're evaluate, you're taking the derivative and um, evaluating at x prime equals z, it's not going to contribute to this integral because it's not dependent on x prime once you work it out. So let me pull it out in front. So dl of 1 over x minus x prime evaluated at z a. And then we are left with the integral, if you compare, just this integral over the density and um, this x prime minus z. So this is what we have. And this is now in a nice form that we like because um, this integral is basically the multiple moments of the body. So then x prime minus z a. So here now we can put the STF because we know this is gonna be STF. So these are the definitions of the multiple moment. Ma I should say mass multiples. So we might discuss later there are also different current multiples. Um, so mass multiple moments, and let me denote them by M A L. Um, the reasoning was that this thing is STF. So initially this was not STF. But then since I know, okay, let me, let me write down what this thing is. Um, this is uh, minus one to the L times two L minus one dollar factorial and L divided by RA to the L plus one. Okay, because I know this here is STF. This isn't, but I know that only this is the STF part of this contributes, so I might as well put these brackets here. Okay, sorry, this is probably too small. Let me just write it bigger. Um, so this is minus one to the L. Two L minus one. Okay, maybe. Is, is that uh, readable or? Yeah, it's the same thing that Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just say for formula. Uh, one. Let's let's say this is equal to one, basically. So finally, we can write the potential as um, sum over l equals zero to infinity, uh, two l minus one, double factorial, um, which comes from this derivative thing here. And then L factorial comes from the Taylor expansion. 
And then we just have these unit vectors, STF, um, divided by R to the L plus one, and then the multipole moments of the body. Okay, and this is the nice form that we like. Um, okay, and let me say, uh, so here I'm using the notation that Na is equal to x minus Za. You know, I, I don't want to write out this thing every time, divided by Ra. <laughs> okay, and Ra is equal to magnitude of x minus Za. Um, no, be, because here the prescription is you're supposed to differentiate and then evaluate at, okay, I, I should have written it down, is at x prime equals Za. So, so the point is this will no longer depend on x prime. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, no, I think, um, yeah, in this case, no, I'm uh, differentiating with respect to x prime because, so what we want to consider is in fact, um, yeah, I think it's, um, so let's see. So we had here, this, exp oh, okay, where did it come from? Yeah, I'm differentiating with respect to x prime because I, I want to, to um, instead of evaluating the potential source, um, so let's say here's x, and here I um, have the reference point z, and in here I use the variable x prime. And so I, I want to approximate the potential generated by all of these values of x prime as expansions around x. So yeah, so maybe I should indicate somehow a prime on this. Okay, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Okay, then um, we just continue on. So now, um, this e expansion um, of potentials in terms of these STF quantities is very useful for when you want to consider orbital motion in a binary system, for example. Because then it's very convenient to have these Cartesian coordinates and everything. But in some situations, um, you want to consider sort of the expansion of the potential just for the body itself, which is almost spherical, so it's more convenient to use a spherical harmonic expansion. And so now we want to see how this can be equivalently written in terms of a spherical harmonic expansion. And we will use both of, both of these um, ways to expand the potential um, depending on the situation. One is always more convenient than the other. So, so now we consider the relation to spherical harmonics. And um, that's not so difficult to work out because we can just, we have this unit vector n and we know how to write it in spherical coordinates. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to give some examples of these multiple moments. Um, yeah, okay. Let me first give some examples to write out explicitly because sometimes if you're not used to the notation in terms of this L and STF, it's a bit difficult to, uh, to know what it means. So, the first few multiple moments of this body um, So first we have the mass for L, L equals zero. 
the mass of body A is just the integral d cubed x of the density. Okay, we don't have any factors of, um, of this x prime minus z to the L. And then um, for L equals 1, we have the dipole moment, um, mi, let's say, is the integral d cubed x rho x minus z a to the i. And, but you can always choose this z a in such a way to make this vanish. So, so you can always choose, um, always choose a coordinate system such that this dipole moment vanishes. And um, th when you choose, make such a choice, um, your z will be at the center of mass of the body. Okay, then this corresponds to the center of mass choice. Okay, and then the next moment, L equals two. Okay, we have M A I J, which I, I will often denote just by Q I J. I don't know, it's just sometimes more convenient instead of writing, having all these M A factors, um, Q I J, let's say A. Um, and that's equal to integral d cubed x rho and then x minus z a i j for Newtonian, for Newtonian. We will see how to define it in relativity um, later in some later lectures. And um, okay, I, I erased it almost, yeah, so, so let me just say this x minus z a i j Here's what you're supposed to do. Ij is to symmetrize on the indices. So it's x minus z a i, x minus z a j, and then you have to subtract the trace. And as I said, this afternoon you will see the general formula and how to do it in general. Um, minus one third delta ij magnitude of x minus z a squared. Okay, so, so this is just what you need to um, com compute this quadrupole moment. And then you can keep going for higher moments. Okay, so finally, as I said, uh, we come to the relation to spherical harmonics. Okay, so we know in spherical coordinates, we have, when we have a unit vector n, which is equal to x over r, just uh, in general, um, we can write this as sine theta cosine phi, um, sine Theta sine phi and cosine theta. So this is simply x over r, y over r, and z over r. You know, in, when you write down the conversion to um, spherical coordinates. Okay, and that already suggests that, um, you know, if you have product of these ends, you will get something like sine theta squared cubed and then e to the i m phi will be related to sine phi. So there is an immediate relation to spherical harmonics. So and in the precise relation to spherical harmonics uh, between, because maybe you're also more familiar with uh, spherical harmonics than with these STF tensors um, NL, and the spherical harmonics YLM, theta phi. Okay, the, these are the standard spherical harmonics. 
that yeah, I'm sure you've seen many times. Um, so there's a formula you can use to convert from one to the other that um, you will also work out some examples of this afternoon. So there are some tensors, YLM, um, Okay, I, I will explain in a bit what these coefficients are. But basically, they, they convert from the spherical harmonic basis to some unit vector basis. Um, and then we have NL. Okay, that's to go one way. And then to go the reverse way, there are some factors that come in um, because of some properties of normalizations and so on. So you, you can also convert NL two spherical harmonics. Um, so the, the formula there is 4 pi L factorial divided by 2L plus 1 double factorial. And then sum over L, uh, sum over M is minus L to L. Um, and then again, these tensors but this time not complex conjugated, um, and YLM. Okay, so those are some formulas that I'm claiming hold. So these are just some constant coefficients, um, which we will work out now just to see how, how these come about. So, for example, now let's take um, relation example. It's a very simple example, and this afternoon you will work out a more complicated one. Um, relation between, okay, let's just take the vector itself and um, and Y uh, one M, and let's just take one component of the vector, namely N X, because otherwise it's a lot of work. Um, so for for I equals X. Okay, so th what does that mean? Well, we need to take N X given here, sine theta cos phi. So we have nx is equal to sine theta cos phi. Okay, then we need to know those ylms for l equals one. Okay, which, okay, you can look up in your favorite uh, table of mathematical functions or online or ask Mathematica. So y10 is square root three over four pi cosine theta, and y1 plus or minus 1 is equal to minus plus square root 3 over 8 pi um, sine theta e to the i phi. Okay, this I looked up. Okay, and um, so then we want to see, for example, um, okay, which way did we want to go? Yeah, let's use this formula here. So we don't have to worry about STF because we, we just have NX, so there's just one index. Um, this, so this side is fine. And now we're claiming this is supposed to be equal to some prefactor times the sum over M of some conversion factors times those y, YLMs. So let's just write that down. So we want to say sine theta cos phi is equal to, um, okay, so now um, for pi L factorial, we have L equals one, so I need only four pi. So I put four pi, okay. Then in the denominator, we have two L plus one double factorial. So for L equals one, that's three double factorial, so just three. So four pi by three. And now we're supposed to sum over m, so let me just write it down um, in 
just general, so y one zero x, because I'm just taking the nx component, um, and then y one zero plus uh, y one one x, y one one plus y one minus one x component um, y one minus one. Okay, that's. I, I simply wrote out this formula here, simply writing out the sum explicitly. So now I can substitute um, for what these YLMs are. Um, okay. Uh, so we can already almost immediately see, because this Y10 goes as cosine theta, and here I have sine theta, so we, we already can see that this thing has to be zero, because otherwise I get cosine theta equals sine theta, so it's um, not, not going to be. So we can immediately see this has to be zero. Okay, that, does that make sense? Good. Okay, so th then we're left with, um, yeah, okay. So one property I didn't tell you yet f for these um, YLMs is simply that they have the identity YLM um, star, and no, um, okay, y, uh, YL, minus m is equal to minus one to the m ylm star. Okay, that, that's just an identity that they supposedly satisfy. You can also show it, but we don't want to go into this. Um, if you want to read more about this, there's a review um, paper by Kip Thorne. It's called Multipole Expansion of Gravitational Radiation where he discusses many of the properties of these um, YLMs. Um, yeah, that's from 1980, that paper. Okay, so let me just write down what we're still trying to solve. So sine theta cos phi is equal to four pi by three, and then um, y11 one one x, Y11, one one. and then now I'm, so you see here I have exactly the situation that Y L minus M, so I'm going to rewrite this as minus one to the M, but M equals one, so it's minus one, um, Y11 one one star. Okay, um, so it's, Um, okay, uh, sorry, I lost the place in my notes. Minus um, y11 one one star uh, y1 one minus one. Okay, and again, you can, so now we have just um, these contributions here. So sine theta is already fine. And then we have here e to the i phi. So we, we can see um, we have y11 one one will be e to the i phi and then, uh, okay, i m phi, plus, yeah, okay, this is what I forgot in the notes, um, plus or minus i phi, sorry about that. So you see to get cosine of phi, we need um, exactly that um, y11 one one star is equal to y11. One one. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, because here I have the minus sign for the L equals, if M equals plus one. Okay, so to get, to get cosine phi, phi, the reasoning is need um, Y11 one one star equals Y11. One one. So, so this um, tensor has to be real. So, so then finally we can C sine theta cosine phi is supposed to equal um, four pi by three, 
y11. And now substituting for what these ylms are, um, so then we have minus square root three over eight pi sine theta, and then two cosine phi, because I, I had contribution from both. Um, yeah, because I had, um, yeah, I had e to the i phi plus e to the minus i phi, which is two times cosine um, phi. Okay, um, and then finally working it out. Well, yeah, you can almost read it off now. Um, yeah, so, so simply solving for y11 is only the x component. Um, y11 x is equal to, so sine theta cosine phi already matches. So we just have the, to combine these prefactors. Um, so it's minus square root three over eight pi. Okay, so this is just an example. So the, um, you can always work out these tensors and they will just be numbers. They can be complex in, in general. Um, and in general, they, you know, they, they will be tensors, for example. Um, yeah, this was just the X component, but there will also be a Y component and a Z component and so on. And in general, of course, many more components. Then, um, this was just to basically to, to say, whenever you have a quantity that's expressed in terms of these unit vectors, you can convert to an expansion in terms of spherical harmonics and vice versa. So now we want to apply it to the gravitational potential, um, which is just, so that expansion is, for example, useful when you want to calculate um, certain parameters um, that influence the tidal effect. So I, I just want to give it um, at this stage and later on we will discuss it in more detail because for the orbital dynamics it's always more convenient to have the STF tensors instead of the YLMs. But um, so, so you can write down uh, again the potential in A's exterior. Um, so you can write it as now a function instead of as a function of x, it's a function of um, spherical coordinates, so r theta and phi. So then, in, so um, before in the STF tensors, I don't know if it's still there. I can, yeah, I erased it. But basically, for the STF tensors, we had an the sum over L equals zero to infinity. And now we see from the conversion there comes an additional sum now over all M. Um, so sum M just from minus L to L. And um, so, so then it depends sort of on your normalization, but usually um, to make the one-to-one -one correspondence with expansions in electromagnetism, one chooses this kind of normalization. Uh, so 4 pi g over 2l plus 1, um, ylm of theta and phi, and then the spherical multipole moments that are usually denoted ilm divided by r to the l plus 1. And, um, you know, using all of these uh, properties to convert between spherical harmonics and unit vectors, and the result for the multipole moments, one can find the relation between these ILMs and the multipole moments um, defined for STF. And for, for this kind of normalization, we have um, ILM is equal to integral rho r to the L uh, ILM star of theta and phi uh, d cubed x. And um, this turns out to be just this YLM tensor um, 
contracted with the mass multipole moments that we had before in terms of STF. So, but um, this is a bit up to the normalization if you pull up this kind of factor in front of, and so on. And, it, and also you can convert back Similarly, the relation between these multipole moments, um, so M, A, L, in terms of the spherical multipole moments is a bit more complicated, not simply like this because of um, this normalization. You can also see from here, you always pick up some factor um, in going one way. So this is 4 pi L factorial divided by 2 L plus 1 double factorial sum over m. Um, and then these tensors again, ylm star uh, and ilm. So this is just a, a relation you, you can work out by transforming um, the integral expression that we had before and using those identities to convert between spherical harmonics and unit vectors. Okay, um, so I think maybe I will stop here for today. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so, so this afternoon we'll have some practice problems to sort of get more familiar with these kinds of STF tensors and derivatives of 1 over R and conversion to spherical harmonics. And then tomorrow we'll discuss how to use these tools to get very simple expressions for um, finite size effects in compact binary systems. So then this will all turn out to be very useful. Yeah, so this small ylm is a conversion factor. So I, I don't know that it has a specific name. Um, it's basically just a, a, a matrix to change bases. Sometimes you know you have those kinds of changes of bases, and it's simply defined by by these types of relations because you want to say the spherical harmonics are equal to some. Um, some matrix applied to the unit vectors. And then we showed, we worked out the example for what uh, the components of this matrix are here. Um, so we worked out one, the x component of that, of that for, what, for one, one. So, so that allowed us to, to write nx, so nx in terms of ylm. Yeah, um, I don't know if, if there's a more intuitive explanation, but it's basically because you can write M in this way, and you know the spherical harmonics are also sine theta something something. So you have to combine ends in a certain way to get spherical harmonics. And this tensor tells you how to do it, basically. On the body? On the body, this is just general formula. We have not made any assumption on the body. Um, yeah, I've assumed that it's almost spherical, so you can, so this expansion makes sense. I mean, if it's a totally chaotic, uh, weirdly shaped body, then these kinds of expansion. Then the full expansion. Yeah, in, in principle, yes. And in general, so in, you can also include a time dependence here. So this potential can also depend on time, and then these multipole moments will also depend on time. So, so that, that can also be there. Because then the density will depend on time, basically, not only on x. And um, I mean, the assumption was that this prefactor, the, the, the multiple moments are normalized such that there is this prefactor. I mean, it's just a choice of convention. Um, no, um, no, it's no, no assumptions on the symmetry. 
I mean, the, this fact that you then um, generate these symmetric trace-free tensors comes just because you're differentiating one over R, basically. And that uh, naturally, you will maybe see it, um, this afternoon in the exercises that this naturally leads to symmetric trace-free tensors. It's just, uh, yeah, that, that just comes out. Yeah. It's just mathematics, yeah. They both, uh, both these ML and these ILMs describe the same object. And yeah, it's just uh, how you choose the mathematical description. 